All right, good evening, everyone. Let's grab seats if we can. That's not mine. <laughs> All right, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the very first 2018 Dr. Cog Board of Directors meeting in the new home. So congratulations to our staff on being able to still be working <laughs> and, and a whole lot of coats that were up there. So uh, we were down here last Monday, it was a week ago, and the number of totes that had been moved over the weekend were about floor to ceiling. On Wednesday, they were all gone. So to all the guys and gals that uh, here, of the employees of Dr. Cog and those are all we greatly appreciate all the work. Uh, Doug, Connie, and the, and the employee team to help put this together, it went off very well. There was a little light problem up in one of the conference rooms that we just left, <laughs> but that's part of the punch list or far. But again, uh, thanks everyone. I hope you will bear with us. We're going to try a couple of things because of the way the room is configured, very long and narrow. This is very much the same setup we had at the old office, except we don't have the tier for the second one. But uh, we're going to try this one and see how it works. If it doesn't work, we'll figure out another arrangement. First of all, let me call the meeting to order, and then I will ask you please all join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. America. Hey, how are you? I'm good, actually. Oh. Ms. Garcia, would you please take the roll? Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio. Jeff Baker. Here. Where are you going to go? Elise Jones. Doug Gardner. David Beacom. Here. Randy Wheelock. Sean Wood. Anthony Graves. Here. Kevin Flynn. Jolan Clark. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Angles. Libby Zabo. Here. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Larry Bidham. David Spellman. Karen Brockett, Here. Margo Ramsden, Lynn Baca, Matt Johnston, Roger Hudson, Ben Price, George Teal, Tammy Mauer, Here. Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Here. Linda Olson, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Carolyn Scharf, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey. Here. Scott Norquist, Storm Glor, Jim Dale. Here. Ron Rakowski, Here. George Lance, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton. Hello. Dana Goodwine, Jacob LeBure. Here. Jerry Bean, Isaac Levy, Karina Elrod, Kyle Schlachter, Jacob Lofgren. Here. Wynn Shaw. Here. John Peck. Marsha Martin, Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan, Barney Drystadt. Here. Grace Palazuski. Paul Sutton, Sean Foray, Chris Larson. Here. Jordan Sowers, Julie Mullico, John Dyack. Here. Sally Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Rita Dozal, Mark Blasis, Jessica Sandgren, Jackie Phillips, Herb Atchison. Here. Bud Starker. Here. Adam Zarin. Deborah Perkins Smith. Present. Bill Van Meter. Here. Okay. And this mic setup, folks, is a little bit different. You don't need to punch buttons because once you start talking, it's going to come on. So you'll see the little red lights. If you get close to it and make a noise, that red light will come on, it means that you're on the recording. So be aware that uh, unintended conversations may get publicized. <laughs> Next, we'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. I have a motion is a second. 
All those in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Before we go any further, Barney Drystadt, Barney from Lyons, George Lartz. Lance. Lance. Lance, I'm sorry. George is here, okay, from Greenwood Village. Chris Larson from Netherland. And we have a new member from have Denver. Any member from Denver in the room? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Just want to make sure. Welcome our new members. Just going to stick with the old. All right, moving on to the report of the chair, uh, let me start with the RTC that met uh, Monday was a week ago. Actually, we met here. That was the first meeting we had with the group was sitting here. Three action items of that night, uh, discussion on the federally required Title VI implementation plan, uh, the TDM set-aside project funding recommendations, and then the confirmation of seven special interest seats on the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, we will hear some of that as we go through the reports tonight on the uh, outcome of that, so I'll leave that till we get to the panel discussions on that. But those are the three items that we had um, on Monday, and then there was an explanation of the current TIP policy that we're going through now, so that everyone at the transportation, the TRC would be able to understand the policy, so that's been given to you at Ignosium at this point, so I think everybody pretty well understands the TIP. And then we did also have a legislative update from uh, Rick Morrow and what was left over from the legislation. We may still hear some more of that yet tonight. So with that, uh, I'll move on to the Performance and Engagement Committee. Mr. Chair, or there you go. Mr. Dyack, if you would, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we had our meeting uh, before this meeting. Uh, we discussed the board workshop agenda. We finalized it out, a little bit of tweaks. I think Brad did a great job. Um, also, uh, if you haven't um, if you haven't signed up, uh, Connie uh, put forth an email for uh, rooms uh, with a discount code a week or two ago. So, any questions, uh, talk to Connie. Uh, we also initiated our the performance evaluation of the executive director. Uh, we uh, we're going to continue that next month, and we have a collaborative assessment that is going to be sent to all of us on July sixth. Uh, Jerry just wants some feedback on um, on some some things. Uh, it will close July 20th, so we would encourage you to uh, complete that as soon as possible when you received. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Finance and budget, please. Thank you. <clears throat> so we met this evening also. We discussed uh, authorizing the executive director to carry out our Way to Go program funding for 18 and 19 with through contracts with CDOT. Um, we also authorized to receive additional funding uh, for our agent, area agency on aging, so that's great. And most notably, we had a presentation of our 2017 audit in which there were some corrective actions, but there were no findings reported in the audit for federal awards, so for our federal money. So that was great news, and that's what we discussed. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Any other comments from anyone on the reports of the directors for either P&E or F&B? Okay. Next item on the agenda is a report of the executive director, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, number of items this evening. First of all, of course, the move, as the chair mentioned, we are in, in some shape or fashion. We're happy about that. Uh, and I, I must say, it, it went as smoothly as possible. You can imagine a move of this size, you know, 26,000 square feet, 10 or so employees, 112 employees. Um, it went really well. I think staff is really enjoying the new location. Um, we definitely, from from a staff perspective, the amenities that are you know um, that it offers at this location versus the other is, is superior. We do understand that parking is a uh, is an issue. Um, you know, it's is more of a premium than in the, oh, there we go. Um, it's a bit of a premium. Um, I hope you all were able to get in the garage if you so desired this evening. Um, that was my biggest fear. I woke up in the middle of the night that there would be 59 elected officials wandering downtown trying to find this place. <laughs> so, so I'm glad you're able to all get here this evening. Um, with regards to if you did park in the building, there is a validation procedure that is similar to the last one, although there's no pink slip anymore. Um, there's a there's a uh, like barcode that you have to read, and I'm just kind of like Connie. Would you explain exactly what you do? Um, you know, once you once you leave the building today. So you need to exit on the Arapaho side. You'll see uh, signs for the cashier exit. Take the cashier exit. That's the um, exit on Arapaho. 
when you get down to the kiosk uh, and you pull up the little blue light will start flashing where you put your white ticket that you got out of the kiosk that goes in arrow first it'll sit there and it'll calculate the cost of your parking and then you take this slip and there's a red area down at the bottom and you just slide this in there and it it reads the QR code on there and validates the parking and then the gate should go up and you should be able to get out if you have difficulty getting out there is a silver button there for the for the parking attendant and I believe that they are more responsive than our last <laughs> just uh, one reminder make sure that each time you come down as a board that you're down here for a function to do with the board you have to get the little QR code from staff they're only one time use it it's no good so don't compile them thinking next time because once it's used it's done so again make sure you see staff before you leave to get one, Connie or probably me. Yeah. <laughs> normally, normally Connie. If Connie's helping with someone, it might be Roxy if she happens to be around. But make sure to get that QR code before you leave. All right. Why not? Else, <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so that's not a parking. Um, so restrooms. In case you don't know yet, um, if you just go out any one of these interior doors. Hang it right, and there's signage up, and so the bathrooms are down that way. So, uh, so there you go on that. Microphones, uh, the chairman already mentioned the microphones. You really don't have to touch anything. You have some cards made up to alert you to that. There is one option, though. So the microphone is activated as soon as you project into it. Um, but you can, if you want to have a side conversation, you, there is a mute button that you can use. Just remember to unmute that before you speak. So that's, that's the only requirement from that. I think up to four mics can be live at one time. So there you go. Um, oh, can I, can I mention this? One last thing about the move. Is Roxy Ronson in the room? I don't think she is. She's in She's She is? You want me to go get her? I'll get her. I'll move on, uh, but I would like to come back to that um, real quick afterwards. So let's talk about Bike to Work Day. Not only is this our first board meeting in the new building, because that wasn't busy enough, Bike to Work Day was also today. And um, we're estimating about 35,000 riders this year, which is an increase of about 1,000 last year. We'll know, you know uh, better numbers here in the next couple of days. So it's fabulous. We're obviously still the second largest free. Um, you know, we had 300 plus breakfast stations and bike home stations, mostly water. Uh, especially with the triple digit heat that's probably a good idea um, uh, you know you may have noticed in, in the introductory we had some slides had some photos up there of um, uh, just showing some of the some of the many jurisdictions that hosted uh, stations we had we had 20 in all that hosted stations so thank you all very much we really appreciate you contributing to the success of this event is it is a great event and uh, and uh, we're obviously very proud of it. Um, and talk about a collaboration. We had over 700 businesses that participated in the corporate challenge. Um, so that was fabulous. Uh, it was a beautiful morning. I was surprised. I actually I came from Castle Pines and um, left at some ungodly hour. But um, you know, it's supposed to be 100 degrees here today. I, I'm, my first five miles, I was actually chilled. I mean, I was cold. I'm like. When I lived in Oklahoma City, you know, when I woke up in the morning when it was supposed to be triple digits, it was 85 degrees at 5 o'clock in the morning. Anyway, um, so really a big thank you to, to Steve Erickson and Celeste and all the Way to Go team. They do a fabulous job on this. Also, big shout out to Communications. The media coverage that we received related to this was fabulous. Um, so thank you all very much. Um, speaking of way to go, uh, we um, we were honored with a national marketing award. Steve, do you have that award? Uh, I forgot to bring that down, Doug. Oh well, <laughs> I was still here to hold it up. <laughs> yes. So we received this over the past week. It was presented by the Association of Marketing and Communication Professionals. Um, it's a platinum award for excellence in the, for way to go's integrated marketing campaign in 2017. And so, congrats again to Steve and his uh, very capable team. Uh, board workshop that's also been mentioned, uh, August 24th and 25th at Keystone. Please, registration, hotel registration is now open, so please sign up. We want to get a great crowd, as we did last year at that event. The P&E, as uh, Director Dyack mentioned, um, approved and finalized the agenda uh, uh, just a, an hour ago at the P&E, so we'll be getting that out to you here in the coming days. Uh, so, is Roxy here? Yeah. 
Okay, I want to go back to the move real quick. I, I, I know, you know, many of you know Roxy. There are a lot of you that don't know Roxy. She works behind the scenes in this agency, and this, this lady is unbelievable. What she has done, the number of hours she has put in associated with this move, you would, you would be shocked. I tell her to go home, but she don't listen to me. She never listens to me. But she, uh, she's, she's fabulous. And Roxy, I just want everybody to know how fabulous you are. And, uh, and, and I hope everybody would join me in, in thanking her with the appropriate way. Thanks again, Roxy. Okay, a couple more things. So active transportation, we're in the process of developing an active transportation plan. Um, and we're working with stakeholders from around the region, working on our, I mean, it's really, it is our first ever regional active transportation plan of, of, this, of this ilk. Um, and we're excited about the outcomes. We're talking about designing a, a system which is accessible and uh, available to all ages and uh, incomes and abilities throughout this region. We do have a survey that's associated with that. And, um, we were out and about at our at breakfast stations this morning, um, you know, interacting with, uh, with riders, and we got some great input from those guys. But if you wouldn't mind sharing the uh, information that we have on our website with your available sources, that would be fantastic. We'd like to get as much, much information um, through that survey effort as we can. Is Director Dozal here tonight? Well, I, I will at least mention this. So we do, this, I, I mentioned this before, um, we do these lunch and learns every month. And um, actually, uh, Director Conklin has, has, uh, has spoke at a couple of those. Well, Rita, she spoke uh, this past month on, uh, you know, she was a big, big wig telecommunications person back in the, back in the day. And um, so she, um, she actually gave a present to shoot. It was a lecture, not a presentation, on the story of communications at the speed of light. And it was tremendous. So the whole history of the telecommunications field, it, it was fabulous. Uh, and I would recommend it highly if uh, anybody's looking for a speaker. Um, two more things. One is another personal item. I'd like to uh, uh, recognize uh, Bob Roth uh, and, uh, and congrats to him for winning uh, his re-election on the CML's um, executive board. So. Rest of that. And last but not least, um, staff, we've had some conversations lately about Senate Bill 1. Uh, just to refresh your all me memory, the, it passed, passed the legislature this past year, which provides some general fund monies for, uh, for transportation purposes. Um, most of that is going, uh, would go, you know, directly to CDOT. There was a small chunk in there that was set aside for, uh, for local communities um, that will be that will be distributed through the uh, HUTF formula, but there was also another part in that bill which was called the multimodal fund, and it was 15% of the total. So a portion of that will be allocated to the um, TPRs and MPOs, of which we are one. We will receive, you know, a vast a good portion of that money as a result of how the formulas we believe will be calculated. So we're having discussions right now, at least internally, about how we would get that money, whether, you know, how, how it would uh, interact with the current TIP call for projects that we're planning on doing, whether we do it as a separate call or include it in there. Well, just, just so you all know that this, this is not lost on us. We're having those discussions. We are going to bring some options and scenarios and then ultimately a, um, uh, have a discussion with TAC and then provide you all with a recommendation next month about how we as, a, we as an agency will, um, will, will uh, uh, allocate that money, the process that we'll have. So I just wanted to let you know that we are aware that you know, that's out there and um, alert you to it all. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'm done. Okay. Any questions of the Executive Director on his report? At this point, we'll take and uh, open up the period of time. We allocate up to 45 minutes to allocate for public comment. The speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Do we have anyone present who would like to address this from the public? They just cut the meet meeting by 45 minutes. I <laughs> uh, would entertain a motion at this point to move forward with the consent agenda.
I have a motion and a second. All those in favor by aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, we'll move on to item nine. Presentation of Colorado Department of Transportation Transit Development Program. Mr. David Crutzlinger. Hi, David. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Director X, and members of the board. It's my pleasure to be here before you and, and talk a little bit about the transit development program that CDOT's facilitating statewide to be able to uh, have a representative list of, of projects that could be used in a number of different formats, um, both for statewide planning purposes as well as for ballot purposes. And I'll connect those two in, in just a moment. So I, as I said in my opening remarks, it's a planning tool that, uh, that identifies and prioritizes lists or prioritizes transit project needs. Uh, we've, we've spent some time um, looking around the state at published reports, contacting transit agencies directly, and doing other due diligence to create an initial list. Um, the list is focusing on capital projects at this time, so it does not include um, operating, which um, as we look at statewide planning, we, we do need to capture those other legs of the proverbial stool, if you will. The development program in an unconstrained format is at this point of $5.1 billion, not including front range passenger rail from Fort Collins to Pueblo and not including I-70 corridor, um, advanced guideway system, um, you know, rail to the mountains type of things. So this, this is a very large number statewide. It is unconstrained. 215 projects and growing um, because we're still uh, taking input from around the state on, on the project list. We've spent some time with our Transit and Rail Advisory Committee at CDOT and our statewide Transportation Advisory Council. Um, there are, are member agencies from amongst many of the folks on, in the Dr. Cog region who are helping to uh, provide input on both of those committees. And the intent is to get to a, a list of high, higher priorities, you know, get it down from the $5 billion list that's, that's sort of a wish list and get it to something that, uh, that everyone says these are our highest priorities in each part of the state. And the, the, uh, the track and the stack have identified that, that list as, or that, that target as being $1.5 billion, um, so a much smaller piece than the total $5 billion list. That said, then, we can begin to use a list like that priorities for funding sources that become available. So Senate Bill 267 passed and is, is being challenged legally, so we won't know if that money actually flows until sometime this fall or early in 2019. The 2018 ballot is, is on its way um, in a lot of discussion on, on its way to uh, November for all of us to decide upon. And so this tier one list is something that we can use to show people we know what our priorities are. It is not a promise to voters to build everything on the list. It is an illustrative list, and then TPRs and MPOs each manage their illustrative list through, in this case, your normal Dr. Cog processes to prioritize things from a planning phase into your, into your TIP, which are your committed projects. Um, the ballot language, and I'll go a little further into this, the ballot language has up to $30 million a year that has to be matched 50-50, so when you match it with other funds outside of the multimodal options fund pool, it's $60 million a year that can be used to pay debt, and when you apply the payment formulas and all that, you get up to $800 million in capital projects that could be built with that. Um, I said this, 
$1.5 billion planning target. Uh, we've been working on a regional planning allocation of both the Senate Bill 1 language that, uh, that the Chair mentioned, or uh, Director Rex mentioned, as well as the ballot, uh, refer to a planning allocation based on population and ridership. The, again, the list is a priority. It guides planning. It does not make funding decisions. Those would be ultimately a uh, decision by the Dr. Cog board once the allocation is made to the Dr. Cog region for your share. Um, you guys would then prioritize that. Based on the discussions with all the folks around the state, the preliminary target of the $1.5 billion list is that the Denver metro area would get $945 million of that, or about 63%. The project list has names, scopes, capital cost estimates, and in some cases, the operating costs associated with those if they are very large numbers over and above normal operations. So in, in the case of opening a new corridor, whether it's BRT or light rail or something else like that, you're often taking on a 10 to $20 million operating cost um, by building a project. So it's not just the capital costs, you need to reflect the operating costs. That's what that one's about. For other things where you're, um, you're not taking on a large new operating cost, then those, those numbers are not necessary for, those, for the other projects. Um, in, the, in the Dr. Cog region, what we asked in, in meetings that we've held, we asked uh, agencies from around the region to give us their top three uh, priorities for their individual communities. We got as many opinions as we could, and we got RTD's concurrence if ap applicable. Um, so often, often people say, I want to build a project, and it's going to be a station, or it's going to be this thing or that thing, and then I'm going to give it to RTD, and they have to maintain it. So of course, uh, uh, if RTD is going to be asked to maintain it, we want RTD's concurrence on that. <laughs> um, by asking multiple cities, counties from around the Dr. Cog region to give us their one, two, threes, then you can start to see um, everybody's priorities. So there might be a number three on somebody's list that's a number one on somebody else's list. And that helps, helps, to, uh, to, helps to see the priorities. The, the challenges for all this is that uh, time, time is our enemy. Our, you know, to, to come up with something that can be usable as an illustrative reference for the November ballot, we need to have something in place, we think, by August. Again, it's not a promise to deliver every single project on the list. It is a list that you guys can refer to as saying, these are the priorities within the Dr. Cog region. We'll use Dr. Cog process to make decisions over the 20-year life of the, of the uh, ballot, the ballot uh, term, and we will you know, Dr. Cog processes will move things from planning into com committed projects, and will, you know, as things change over ten years or over, over twenty years. Growth happens in places that we didn't think it happen, or you know, interest rates and other things like that affect the project list. Those adjustments will be made by you all by your decisions. Our commitment at CDOT is to continue to work with you all through at least August to make sure whatever we have is the as an illustrative list statewide as well as representing the Dr. Cog region is as accurate as possible and is best representative of what your all's current opinion is at this time. Let's see. Talked about some of this. The, uh, the ballot language uh, breaks the funding stream into three, three pools. So roughly speaking, there's $105 million that would be created by the ballot language for multimodal option fund projects. Multimodal option fund includes bicycle, pedestrian, transit, and transportation demand management. You can fund all of those projects. Up to $30 million off the top is for bonding. And bonding projects need to, you need to know that you're paying an extra 50% in financing costs over a 20-year life at 4 to 5% interest. So the projects really need to be projects that have to be built in a short period of time, like in a downtown location of, of one of your communities, because you don't want to do pay-as-you-go and have a 10-year construction project in the middle of one of your downtowns. So that's, that's a good bonding project. You want to get it done in one year. Um, after the off-the-top $30 million, uh, so that, let's say, 105 minus 30 gives you $75 million. 85% of the $75 million then is pay-as-you-go 
again, distributed to all the MPOs and TPRs by, by formula. Again, the estimate at this time is the Dr. Cog region would receive 63% of 75 million, comes out to, I think, 54, uh, 64, 54, 64 million. Um, <laughs> And then the last 11 million or so um, goes through CDOT for our Transportation Commission to make decisions on. And again, that's not necessarily that those would all be CDOT specific projects. Those would be just um, decision through, through the Transportation Commission. So I'm throwing a lot at you. I'll entertain questions very shortly. Um, <coughs> Candidate bond, bonded projects, I said a little bit in the previous slide, they need to reflect your all's priorities. They've got to be really high priorities. They've got to be good projects, capital projects. You don't bond for a, a bus that's a 15-year life with a 20-year with a payment. You don't pay for a million-dollar project and have a half a million dollars in, in debt costs if, if you can do that on a pay-as-you-go basis. So we're looking at projects that are more, most likely $10 million or larger in project size, and they have to be matched 50-50. So you guys look at the 40% of the ballot funding that's coming to you all through the HU2F formula to your individual cities and counties, and tell us either you've got the match from that funding or you've got the match from some other, uh, other funding sources. It doesn't, doesn't all have to be local. If you've got federal funding or some other sources coming to it, the, the language just says a maximum of 50% can be paid out of the multimodal option fund. Covered that. So next steps for us is to continue to work with, with all of you to continue to work on that bonding list and the tier one list. We expect the bonding list, sort of the highest of the high priorities to be um, adopted by the trans our Transportation Commission in July. Again, as an illustrative list, it will keep working on the much larger list um, for adoption or acceptance sort of endorsement in August. And I'll turn it to the, the chair. Thanks, David. Comments or questions? Ms. Walton. If we have questions to clarify any of the projects, um, who should we contact, please? Um, you can contact me or uh, my staff member, Jeff Sanders. Jeff, will you uh, raise your hand in the back there? We're happy to help on any of those. Okay. Mr. Brockett. So what are the input opportunities for the shaping of that Tier 1 list? Um, th this is an excellent uh, input opportunity. In um, if, if there's, uh, I guess, <clears throat> we're, we're seeking input um, through, through our Transit Rail Advisory Committee in mid-July and through our uh, Transportation Commission um, discussion also in mid-July for, for the August, uh, anticipated August adoption. Through the commissions, because I would probably work with my Transportation Department, you know, to sure. weigh in on that. And so would, would they contact CDOT directly, what would be the, the best out? You could contact us directly or you could work, work through, um, through Jeff or I or work through the Dr. Cox staff to whatever your pleasure is on that. Thank you. And will there be public input opportunities? And, and, and I'll, I'll just preface this by saying that like, well, it's going to be a big push to fund the full Tier 1 list, right? But if you're not even on the Tier 1 list, that's going to be really tough to get the money. So is there an opportunity for people to weigh in on what's most important to them in their transit future? Uh, give, given the short amount of time, we hadn't anticipated a, a large public involvement process. And to your <coughs> second question, being on the list doesn't mean that you're guaranteed. And not being on the list doesn't mean you're locked out forever. This, this all comes back to you guys if the ballot passes. It's, it's your money. You make the decisions, Dr. Cog process. So we won't be restricted to, dropping the, to the Tier 1 list. We can mess right, with those. Right. OK, that's great. Thank you. Ms. Cressman. Um, I've been asked by several citizens, what is the criteria for determining your priority? What, what did you consider when you decided what was a priority? We, we, we didn't decide the priorities. We asked uh, member governments what their priorities were. So I can't answer that question for people other than that. I, I've been asked, is it all political? That's what I've been asked. Is, would that be a true statement? Um, no, I, I don't believe that's the best way to characterize it. <laughs> I think the uh, staff from all the communities have, have provided the input um, representing the, 
the point of view of each of their communities. Mr. Dale? Can I, can I, can I respond to that a, a different way? Would... I, I don't, I, I'm just passing a question along. Understood. Mr. Dale? How about crossovers between TIP uh, projects and this? An example might be Peaks the Plains Trail. Uh, I think that's up to uh, you all and the Dr. Cog board how, if you want to commit projects from the next four years of funding to leverage future projects or to pay portions of future projects. I don't know if I answered the question the way that you intended. Did you hear the question? No. I okay. So, Jim, repeat your question. Well, you know, we're having sub-region meetings on TIP, and so we're asking things are prioritized in there. We're going through a thing, and it may or may not be something that some of us have a priority on. But this is, is another, we have a multimodal fund here, I, as I understood it. And so there might be certain uh, projects within subregions consideration. So should subregions TIP meetings be thinking about this as we do our functions? That's my other way. <laughs> well, I, Mr. Chairman, if I may. I, I think that's a legitimate question, and, and quite frankly, I don't think it would hurt to have those strategic discussions at the at the at those subregional forums, right? I mean, the monies that David is talking about, at least that the the bond portion of the list, is um, you know it, it's it's projects that the, the seat up will be using. I mean, will be bonding projects, right? And what they did, they set up, they had a couple meetings, and those communities that were that were present in those meetings were asked about what their highest priorities were within their communities. And I think that's ultimately what has built out that list, right? Um, it doesn't mean there's still room on that list for additional projects, too, right? About $250 million worth, you know. So if there are any additional projects that any of you would have any interest in exploring, whether that be with us, Dr. Cog, and us transmitting that, or you work directly with CETA, we'll, we'd be, you know, we'd be happy to have those conversations. Ms. Abel? I figure out how to use this thing. <laughs> just don't touch it, just talk to <laughs> it. Ah, well, I had it on mute, and I don't even know how I got it there. I was oh. pressing buttons. So um, I think we need to be careful about, in our sub-regional conversations, having uh, conversations and saying, well, maybe we can get this project from this this ballot initiative, and maybe we can get this one from the TIP money, because that ballot initiative has a long way to go before it gets money in the bank. And uh, it's not a given. Um, I've seen... Colorado voters get very squirrely about things like that, and there's going to be a lot on the ballot. So I just think we need to be very careful and stay focused in our sub-regional meetings on what, what do we really want as a region and a sub-region. And then it, this is icing on the cake. We, could, we, we got more projects than we can even imagine. We can just go down the list after that. That's my, my two cents. Other comments or questions in regards to what was given in the presentation? We do. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you all for, for, for the time. Next up is a presentation on planometrics with our own Miss Ashley Summers. There we go. Can you hear me? Wonderful. Uh, so my name is Ashley Summers. I'm the Information Systems Manager here at Dr. Cog. And one of my roles is to manage large regional data projects. And one that you may be most familiar with is aerial photography, because we've been doing that one for about 15 years. We've recently started doing a couple of other ones. One in particular I want to highlight tonight, and most specifically I want to talk about how your staff is using the data from one of those projects. So the project that I want to highlight is called Regional Planometrics. What in the world are planometrics? Uh, these are a, it's a suite of features that we 
extract from our aerial imagery. So it's things that we can see from the air that um, are in the built environment. So outlines of buildings, um, sidewalk center lines, parking lots, those um, seven items listed there in purple. So what we do is we take our aerial photography that we get every other year and we pull out these features so that they can be further analyzed, quantified, and um, otherwise looked at. So what makes this valuable? Well, one thing is that the data that we are extracting is very, very um, detailed. You can see in the image there, these are building outlines. Even small indentations can be seen. And that's useful for a variety of purposes that I'll touch on in just a moment. Also, this imagery is manually drawn. So there's a couple of ways you can extract um, this type of information from aerial imagery. A lot of the times people do it in an automated way. So they tell a computer what they want to get, the computer pulls it out, and then you have to um, take a look at that result and do a lot of cleaning because normally the computer misses some things or misclassifies some things. What we've done is build in quality on the front end, and we've actually had technical experts look at our imagery and manually draw in the features. So we know that what we have is exactly right. Additionally, this is based on our draft imagery, which is already very high resolution and accurate to where it's supposed to live on the ground, which is great because that means that the imagery and this derivative product all line up perfectly with this, the data that your staff already collects. So it works really well for everyone in the region. It's current because we do our aerial project every two years, and then we build this data on top of that. And then additionally, uh, this data is regional. So the planometrics data in particular covers about 1,000 square miles, and it crosses many jurisdictional boundaries. It's basically our urbanized core. So far, we've collected data from Idaho Springs to Bennett, from Longmont to Castle Rock. This is the coverage area that we've worked on in 2014 and in 2016. Uh, one thing to note is that our very first project in 2014, uh, we had to cover this entire area and collect data manually from scratch. So it was time consuming and it was expensive. In 2016, we just collected changes. So we took our new imagery and then we just built on the foundation. And in 2018, we're looking to do that same project. We have an upcoming potential project <laughs> that, um, sorry, distracted, um, that we will be planning here very, very soon. So the important thing to note here is that we are maximizing the investment that we've already made in our aerial imagery and in our initial project, our 2014 project. And that makes each one of these subsequent projects cheaper and easier to work with. That moth is stealing my show. <laughs> no, it's like a bring it back. See what you're really doing here. So, uh, how is this data being used? Well, so far we've seen the data um, being used by both the, the public and private sector as well as researchers. Um, in, in a variety of different ways. They've been using their unique focus and perspective to find innovative ways to apply this information. I mean, our original goal was to supply it for municipalities and for counties so that they could use it for, um, for their work, but it has been uh, valuable across the board to, for many other purposes. So for example, it's been used for water runoff modeling, for emergency response planning, uh, and for asset management. Private companies, we've had one startup use it to create a phone app that allows the visually impaired to navigate downtown. And researchers at NREL and UCD have been using it for their own research purposes, for example, to evaluate intersection safety and to estimate energy for different building types downtown. But now I want to focus on your staff and how they've been using the data. These are certainly not all of the examples. There's many, but I pulled out a few here that I think are very interesting. The first is from Arapahoe County. Um, there's a voluntary program that FEMA offers that allows you to participate in activities that show that you're trying to um, minimize your flood risk. And in doing so, you can uh, lower your flood insurance premiums. And so Arapahoe County does participate in this program, and in the past they have had to look at the imagery and quantify these structures on, on their own. So they had to identify what structures are in the floodplain, which is ever-changing. So each year this would take several weeks to do. <laughs> now, since we have these building outlines available, this analysis takes a matter of days. 
In Aurora, they're using this data as the background for many of their web maps. Uh, if you go onto Aurora's um, website, you'll see that they have a very large suite of web maps that explain things that are going on in the city. And now the background of those maps contains our planimetric data, which just helps to provide context and to orient the users of these maps. Additionally, Aurora is using this um, to help their fire department. So they're creating pre-planned maps for emergency response. And what that means is that they can look at these buildings because they're so detailed, and they can make a plan up front for how to respond, what equipment to take, what approach it would be best, so that when they're, if there is a, um, an emergency in that building, they address it um, as efficiently as possible. Douglas County has been doing a sidewalk ramp inventory. Now, they have a, a team of interns that are going out to these ramp locations and getting attributes to add, for example, ADA compliance. And normally what these interns would have to do is go out to this location, collect the information, like attribute characteristics, and then also collect a GPS point. Collecting a GPS point actually takes quite a bit of time, especially when you do it for every one of the ramp points, because you have to wait long enough for the satellites to give you a good answer. Because we already have the data here, we gave them the exact locations, they didn't have to collect those points. They just had to collect the characteristics, which cut their field time in half. And then finally, in Jefferson County, they've been using um, this, our sidewalk data to do a safe routes to schools analysis. I believe in 2017, Jeffco received a safe routes to school education grant, and part of that money was used to create maps to, um, I think there was a pilot of four schools that they've completed so far, um, to determine what are the safe routes for parents and teachers to recommend or to use on their way to school. So there is, like I said, there are several other examples, but um, I don't want to stay up here too long. I do want to say that Dr. Cog has the opportunity to use this data um, to help all local governments, and one of the ways that we can do that is to help um, inform development discussions. So in this image here, you're seeing a 3D representation of those buildings, um, some existing and some imagined. So the colored ones are, um, are a imagined buildings that come out of our land use model. So these are development scenarios. And what's really interesting about this is that you can grow those buildings up within the existing uh, landscape and have a much more informed conversation about what some of your policy decisions will end up looking like um, in the real world, which, which we think should be able to help visualize um, some of our future plans. So before I go, I do want to mention that uh, we are trying to leverage the investment we've already made. Uh, our 2014 project was expensive, but our 2016 project was much less so, and that's because we're building on the project we've already done. We're planning to do that same thing in 2018 and keep that cost um, low or even lower as we move forward because we will continue building out the foundation. The reason that we're able to keep the cost low in going forward is because we're doing this routinely and also because we are doing this um, for a large contiguous extent, so we, across the region. If we got it into, in little pockets, kind of a Swiss cheese type project, we wouldn't be able to um, get a, a good square mileage deal, which is what we're getting right now because we're covering so much area. Um, I have been wondering what the rest of the nation is doing, because this seems like a unique project. So I, I reached out to um, my peers and other MPOs across the nation. I had 12 of them respond to me, and everyone said that they wish they had this program. What normally happens is that a county will do a planimetrics project on their own. It's a one-off project usually. They're expensive and they're difficult and they're complex. So typically, project is done and then people work with the data for about 10 years until it gets refreshed. What we're doing is working together to maintain a high quality data set at all times, which is cheaper and easier in the long run. And at this point, it's the envy of our peers. So uh, I do want to mention that we are planning right now for our 2018 program. I'm meeting with um, several potential partners tomorrow, including a lot of your staff. Your staff received quotes in April for how much it would cost for them to buy in for the next round, um, which was a, a very early uh, discussion of what the scope might be.
Now we're, um, is that me? Sorry. <laughs> Almost done. Um, so we'll be meeting tomorrow to talk about the upcoming project and what we might want to add to the scope or um, otherwise any changes we might want to make as we go forward. So we're looking for additional funding. And um, so one thing, if you are interested, one thing you can do is talk to your staff about how they might implement this data and, uh, and be aware that you might see something come up um, as a budget proposal. With that, are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of quick suggestions. Uh, one, I've dealt with these microphones before. Though they're automatically activated, I think it still serves us better if we all go on mute because many of them are flaring, and I think they're adding to the feedback loop. Also, on the recording, it's still going to pick up background noise that the staff has to... Yeah, like that. Whenever I talk, it's background noise. It happens all the time. <laughs> Surprise. Obviously, we're still calibrating the microphone, yes. so, but it, you're probably correct. So just, just one suggestion. The other thing I wanted to note, uh, especially for this last presentation we're talking about, emergency impact uh, implications of this. Just as a quick reminder, the UASI is very active in the area, the urban area. It's effectively a disaster uh, recovery, uh, terrorism, federal grant organization that we're all a part of. I've been to the last couple of meetings and not seen a Dr. Cog representative there. And so just wondering if we might uh, send a representative now that the move is over, as this tool uh, plays very well in that circle and has value. Thank you. Other comments or questions? All right, Mr. Cottrell. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good evening, folks. So yes, we're going to hear a presentation tonight on things that you've never heard of before, but uh, hopefully we'll keep this nice and smooth and set this document up for, uh, for hopeful action for you uh, your, at your next meeting. Um, so this presentation is um, kind of broken into two different parts. The first few slides really concentrate on how we got here, because this is a process that we started approximately three years ago after the completion and adoption of the 1621 TIP. Um, but the second part of this presentation, really the, the, the majority of it, really focuses on what are, you know, going through an outline of the chapters of the draft policy, which you have included within your attachment. So how did we get here? Again, like I said, we started approximately three years ago after the review um, or after the completion of the last tip. And this is something typically that we'll do after every cycle, both on a policy and technical level. We'll receive your comments and we'll, we'll kind of gather those and say, all right, for the next tip, where do we go? Well, of course, for those who have, have been around, um, we did hear a lot of comments and we decided that there was a major rework that needed to be done for this tip policy. So the direction that we had received from the board was to really form a work group to review and recommend whatever adjustments that, that there may be. Uh, this work group transformed over a couple different, uh, couple different years, a couple different names, um, a couple different white papers, but ultimately the ultimate suggestion that came out was to use what we call a dual model process for the selection of TIP pro pro uh, projects. So, but what is the dual model process? So this is something very unique uh, as what we would look at throughout the rest of the country. Approximately 98, 90% of the MPOs around the nation really use more of a centralized process. And this is where the single MPO will simply um, issue a call for projects, they will receive those applications back, they will go through a scoring selection process, and ultimately their MPO board will select those projects. Well, this dual model kind of takes the same concept, but calls it more regional, but it also breaks out into individual um, allocations. Sometimes these are counties or different cities, but this is a, more of a decentralized process where we can have individual communities or, or counties as a group um, select and recommend projects using their own local input. The dual model uh, project selection process really contains three major components. The first being set-asides. Uh, set-asides are something that's been very common um, throughout the uh, TIP process within the last 10 to 15 years. 
Um, we have formally called these uh, pools, but for this, uh, this process, they are now called set-asides. And these are regional programs, um, which all that, which most of them have their own individual calls for projects throughout the life of the four years of that TIP. The two other major components are the regional share and the sub-regional share. Uh, the regional share, as I mentioned, are these large transformative, transformative projects or programs, which really provide a benefit for the entire region. Uh, the sub-regional share um, takes individual funds and proportions, proportions them out um, to individual counties for the Dr. Cog process. Each one of these counties will form a forum which will make those uh, ultimate decisions and recommendations back to you to have that ultimate uh, project selection into the draft tip. Um, those individual forums will again value, evaluate, select, and make those recommendations. So just a little bit more on the tip set-asides. Um, and this is, again, um, information that you had seen over the life of this process over the last couple of years. And I believe late last year or early this year, um, you had taken action to actually incorporate this into this draft policy document. So this tip set-aside set aside $49.4 million of federal funds off the top over the four years of this tip and it, to be implemented into five individual set-asides. Uh, the first is the community mobility planning and implementation set aside. This is really similar to how we've had other current set aside structured, because this is a combination of the current stationary and master plan and urban center study, along with the small infrastructure projects of the current TDM set aside. So it's really just combining two existing programs that we already have and kind of mushing them into one new set aside. Uh, the second uh, for this tip cycle would be the TDM services. This is really just rebranded to include the TMA partnerships, the, the TDM projects for marketing projects, and the, and the Dr. Cog Way to Go program. Um, the third is the regional transportation operations and transport, regional transportation operations and technology set aside. Uh, this is very similar to what we've had existing. Uh, the only notable um, change has been we've added and technology to hope to incorporate some of the additional and new uh, emerging technologies. Uh, the fourth is a set aside to the RAC for air quality improvements. Um, and the fifth is actually a brand new set aside for this cycle, human service uh, transportation. Um, and this set aside helps to improve services and mobility options for vulnerable populations. So with all of that information, and we kind of sum this up graphically, this is kind of what it would look like. So on the very top, we have the Dr. Cog TIP funds, what we hope to have over this four-year cycle. We would take these set-aside programs off the top, and what's remaining would be proportioned out for the regional and the sub-regional share. Uh, most importantly is that all decisions ultimately will come back to you, the board, for the final recommendation into the draft TIP. So I will pause right there, and before we start going through the actual draft document, is there any comments that you may have? Any questions, concerns? Any comments, guys? Or can we go ahead and move on? Okay, all right. moving on. You've seen it once or twice. Uh, yeah. Yes, you have. Yes, Sorry, but I know it's, <laughs> it's hard to put all this together the first time you see it. <laughs> uh, so like I said, you have the attachment, I think, believe attachment one that's contained within your, um, your packets. Um, this is a very rough draft um, that's both TAC and RTC have seen. Um, again, hopefully, or well, actually starting next month, you'll, believe, um, you'll have this in your packet for an action, and it will start uh, with the TAC packet that will go out here early next week. So this is just a, a, an outline of the draft document that you have. So section one is a simple introduction. Um, this contains the purpose of the actual TIP policy and how it connects MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Um, it also includes other information such as the TIP boundary or wh what are the boundaries for the calls for projects, uh, the time period, and the schedule for the calls for projects. Uh, section 2 outlines the agency roles and requirements. So the TIP policy is not just an outline of how Dr. Cog um, handles its calls for projects. It is an outline of the entire TIP process, which of course CDOT and RTD are part of that. So again, this chapter two outlines the three partners' roles and, re and requirements that they must go through so that we can end up with a completed TIP document. Uh, it also outlines the eligibility requirements for any project that's contained in the TIP, not just one that is Dr. Cog funded. So it explains who the eligible applicants are, 
Um, if you're submitting a roadway or transit capacity project, there's, that project must be contained in the fiscally, fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Uh, if your project contains technology elements, there are special federal requirements for that. Uh, it also outlines what uh, sponsor commitments and uh, what the public involvement process is. So as you can see, as we're kind of walking through these sections, it is kind of a step-by-step -step guide on how this TIP is created from the beginning all the way through adoption. Um, so section three outlines what, what does Dr. Cog need to do before we actually issue the calls for projects. And this is what we're just calling the initial programming. Um, this contains the funding assessment and some of the initial programming, programming activities such as if there's any carryover projects from the existing TIP documents, those projects will be included with the funding that's already identified, not any new additional funding. It also identifies uh, the set-aside programs, which we talked about earlier. It also outlines other commitments. So this TIP uh, will carry two commitments that the board has previously acted on. The first being the, I, the Central 70 commitment. Um, if you remember four years ago, there was a $50 million commitment for the Central 70 project. 25, was already, 25 million was already programmed in the current TIP. The remaining $25 million will carry over over the four years of, of the next TIP. The second commitment is remaining two to three million dollars on our second commitment in principle to fast tracks. So this board um, over two, uh, actually over two times has programmed uh, $120 million to fast tracks in two $60 million commitments. Um, so this two to three million dollars that remains is the only uh, portion that remains on the second commitment uh, in principle that was made to fast tracks. And then finally, we will get to the allocations of the regional and sub-regional process for those calls for projects. So section four outlines, again, like I said, both the regional share and the sub-regional share calls for projects. But first, it, it lists all the eligibility requirements that are required for any project that is selected to use Dr. Cog funds. And this would include um, for projects that require CDOT and RTD concurrence, so for example, if you're um, submitting a project that is within CDOT right-of-way uh, or on a CDOT roadway, you must seek their concurrence. Uh, for RTD, if you're asking them to run, or, uh, run their service or run the service that you're providing, or if you're touching their property, you must have their concurrence. Uh, it also outlines um, that there's IGAs that are required, um, who are the eligible applicants, uh, tip focus areas, which we'll explain more here in a second, um, explains what the minimum funding requests are overall. It also require, it also lists, uh, there's training that is required if you intend to submit for either call, uh, and also outlines project delays. So digging a little bit deeper into the sub, uh, subsection for the regional share, it would list what the intent of that regional share uh, call for projects is. Uh, what is the funding avail availability, um, the eligibility along with the criteria. Uh, it will also outline um, what is expected during the call for projects and how projects are submitted. Um, and then it will outline that Dr. Cog will do the initial review and scoring and then pass those projects on to the project review panel. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that here in uh, just a minute. And then finally, the projects that are recommended from that project review panel will be passed along again through the Dr. Cog MPO process and ultimately the board. For the sub-regional share, very similar. Um, just pointing out a couple differences. Uh, it will outline the funding split for each of the individual um, county forums. Uh, and it will also outline that it's the responsibility of the actual forums to review and ultimately make those project recommendations back to the MPO process and the Dr. Kai board. So TIP focus areas, again, this is a uh, discussion item that you had talked about earlier in the TIP process. Um, and the TIP focus areas, the intent is really to, um, what should the project sponsor focus on? Um, these are not an eligibility requirement, but of course, throughout the criteria, you would receive you know, a higher consideration if you matched more than one more than uh, the other. Uh, the three tip focus areas are uh, improve mobility infrastructure and services for the vulnerable population, uh, increase reliability of the existing multimodal transportation network, 
and three, improve transportation safety and security. And again, like I said, the direction from yourself earlier in this process was you just use these as a guide for both the regional and the sub-regional share process. Uh, so for the regional share approval process, as I was mentioning earlier, um, the applications that will come into Dr. Cog, those applications would actually be scored, uh, submitted by the subregion CDOT in RTD. Um, once Dr. Cog staff reviews those projects for eligibility and completes that scoring, they would pass along those projects to this project review panel. This project review panel consists of one technical representative from each of the eight subregions, um, one CDOT representative, one RTD representative, and up to three subject matter experts. This panel will identify those top projects. Uh, will also allow for allow time for sponsors to make. Um, presentations to the review panel of those top scoring projects. And finally, that pa the panel will make those final recommendations back through the Dr. Cog MPO process. So moving on to section five, um, which kind of wraps up the calls for projects and kind of goes into the final tip development adoption and what happens when projects are actually uh, an active project and when you'd like to amend them. So for the tip development, uh, the peer review process is, is outlined, and this is a process where Dr. Cog's staff, along with CDOT and RTD, will get together and review the collective draft list of projects to see if there's any synergy of these projects that can be made, or if there's any project funding years that we can adjust. I think one thing that we'd like to avoid is having maybe having two construction projects going on at the same time on parallel roads. So those are the types of things that we would look at to see if we can avoid. Um, Throughout, throughout the TIP development process, so I'll also outline waiting lists, and finally, the de development of the draft TIP. So going through the adoption process, um, and it, the, the text is outlined for the public involvement process. Um, sponsors are also allowed to appeal if a project did not make it into the draft TIP. It also explains the requirements for air quality conformity, conformity and finally, the adoption process. So, now that we have an adopted TIP document, um, again, we allow for TIP revisions through either an amendment or sometimes called policy amendments and administrative modifications. Uh, there's also a section that explains, so what happens if a, if a sponsor returns funds and cancels their, cancels their project? Uh, and finally, the subsection of federal funding changes, so what happens if Dr. Cog receives an influx of federal funding or we happen to uh, have to have funding taken away from projects? Uh, finally, there's an appendix section um, just outlines what the selection process is for both RTD and CDOT. Um, is, uh, it lists out the eligible projects by funding source. Um, if you recall um, through earlier discussions in the sub-regional process, um, project sponsors in the sub-regional process basically can submit, submit for any project that they would like um, as long as it is eligible uh, on a federal level. Uh, there's a couple restrictions that Dr. Cog has put in. But essentially, for, all the, for the three funding sources listed in this appendix, it would list the potential types of eligible pro projects they could submit for. Uh, appendix C lists the eligible roadway tr and transit capacity projects that are contained in the fiscally constrained plan. Uh, and finally, the regional share criteria, um, which you just re uh, adopted this last uh, April. Uh, finally, the remaining schedule. So like I mentioned, we're looking for um, your blessing on the TIP policy to take action uh, this next month in July. Uh, and if that takes place, we anticipate that we can open up the regional call for projects very shortly after. Uh, once we go through the entire pro process of the call for projects, the review panel, and the MPO um, process, uh, we expect that that would take through early next year in January. A uh, very similar timeline for the sub-regional process. We believe we can open that up in February. Uh, and finally, concluding with a TIP adoption um, in August. So with that, um, is there any questions, comments, anything that you'd like to see um, changes maybe perhaps within the draft outline or the draft document? I'll make your questions. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Todd. Very, very good, very interesting, and very thorough. Just a question, you know, just for clarity. 
how much more was put into this? How much more difficult was it, or did you have to add in this TIP policy document compared to the last TIP? So process-wise, um, most TIP policies in the past have only taken approximately six to eight months to really put together, and we didn't do a lot of wholesale changes. Um, most of the TIP policies in the past have been right around 90 to 100 pages. This process, it seemingly took almost three years to put together from, from the start. So it was quite a major rewrite, but we also cut the language down in approximately half. I think we're going to end up with about 41, 42 pages. Okay. Mr. Graves, did you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick follow-up question to the staff. One of the things we talked about at a previous meeting was having brief presentations on all of the sub-regional forum processes. Just wondering when that's on deck. Uh, so that would be somewhere probably in this May to June time frame for the sub-regional process. Um, I think one thing to note within the TIP policy, and when you, you know, obviously you see the draft in front of you and you, the draft that you will see in your packet for next month, it is condensed per se. Um, it is not, the intention of the TIP policy is not, not to contain a word-by-word -word reflection of everything that is going to happen or could happen. I think if we try to write in the policy all of that, it would be three times as much and there are, we'd always forget something. So I think what this policy tries to do is give a, maybe a 10, 15,000 foot overview, and it does leave a little bit room for things that are unexpected. Another thing to point out is this is a pilot program, as how the feds have viewed it. So we hope that we have captured everything, but there's no guarantee that we left something out, and I don't think we're gonna know that until we actually run through the entire process. So just to, to clarify, first, I think staff has done an excellent job here, so thank you for taking some time to bring this back. And since this is a pilot, you know, again, all of our sub-regional forums have an opportunity to learn from one another. It's, it's very much trying to kind of share each other's secret sauce to figure out how we might internally tweak each process or maybe even become more uniform in the way that we execute. I recognize that each of our sub-regions is very different, but I, I think the sooner that uh, the body can have that information, uh, the faster that each of us can make the adjustments to create the most efficient and uh, most reflective process for this body. Thank you. Just, just to kind of follow up with where Mr. Gray was talking about, keep in mind that most of us will likely adopt the sub-regional TIP process with no changes. However, we have two outliers, that being Denver and Broomfield, because they're both a region and a sub-region in one. They're still going to have to figure out how they're going to create their criteria for the selection and grading of those projects. From a sub-regional area, you can still go in and add additional criteria for the sub-regional projects in your own region. But you still have to make sure that those pieces you add or change from what's being proposed still have to meet the criteria of the Federal Highway Authority that you will not have something that gets turned back because you didn't use an evaluation criteria. And in those cases, what we've been asking is, if you've got something you think you want to change, talk to the Dr. Cog staff first before you institute it. Uh, just a kind of a question to the board members, is there any group that has not started their regional and sub-regional meetings? Thank goodness. Because well, keep in mind what Todd's talking about is, we're not that way far away from the first call for projects for the regional stuff. So uh, hopefully that you're working through the process, you're meeting with your, your region, your sub-regions, and you're getting your priority piece to get together because maximum of three, again, an advisement. Make sure that you're including CDOT, RTD, and Dr. Cog in your meetings. To the best of my knowledge, uh, Deborah, you and Bill have made sure that we have staff available from your two organizations at every meeting that I have been aware of as well as we have Dr. Cog staff at every meeting that we know of. So make sure that you're still inviting him. Follow the process, the proper notifications, the documentation of the meeting, what decisions were made so that we don't have a issue later on when we try to make those selections. And Mr. Rex, I think you had a comment. I did. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, Director Greg Graves, just to get back to your initial question with regards to the uh, sub-regional presentations, if you were to see the expanded schedule, 
it, it is indeed included in that expanded schedule. So I hope you take some comfort in that. There will be presentations of, of the portfolio or package of projects that the uh, subregions are recommending. Um, God, there was something else also they, they – oh, oh, with regards to how – say again? Yes. Yeah, actually, two more thoughts. So, so the other is one of the requirements, if you recall the federal, the FHWA letter that we received um, about the process and what their expectations are, part of that is that each subregion will have to provide to us how indeed they, they anticipate selecting those projects, whether it's similar to the regional share or some other reasonable, you know, one-off from that, then, um, then we – we have to, we will receive that prior to their call. And last but not least, one other thing that we've been talking about and I've kind of thrown around a little bit and we've talked about the sub-regional meetings is um, we think there's some value in the chairpersons from each of the sub-regional forums as well as the vice chair of those sub-regional forums to get on a call um, probably monthly just to talk about, you know, some of the you know, some of the war wounds associated with the subregions, talk about the possibility of partnering on certain projects, those types of things. Um, and we're planning on implementing that probably mid-July. I'm looking at Ron, he's giving me a thumbs up, so. Other comments or questions on Mr. Cottrell's presentation? Ms. Smith, I see your hand up. Go ahead, Deborah. I just wanted to share some of the comments from RTC. So um, we're very pleased with what the Dr. Cog staff has put together, and it's great to see it put in writing. So thank you very much, Todd, for doing that. And I also share um, Board Director Graves' issue as well. It would be nice to see a presentation, whether it's at, a, at one of the work sessions, just what the process is for each sub-region. Um, and I think it's more the decision-making process as opposed to the actual projects, which I think it, there's a distinction there. Mr. Chairman, I steal the mic from you. Um, we're going to have two mics up here next time, just so you know. I've already talked about it, with staff. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, we'd be happy to do that as part of a work session if that's so desired. Yeah, there's, there's no issue there. Right, Ron? Nod. Thank you. <laughs> I want this whole process, there are so many moving parts to the TIP process and things that are going to affect us external to just our looking at it. Uh, as Director Zabo said a few minutes ago, we have, we have something happening in November that has so many fingers of if one thing's happened, four others don't happen, or if four things happen, one doesn't. Until we get through the November election on all the parts and pieces of transportation and what gets passed and what doesn't get passed on the ballot, there's a lot of questions that are not answered. And whether it's CDOT, whether it's RTD, whether it's Dr. Cog or your municipalities or counties, everything is riding on the outcome of what gets voted in or gets voted down come the election. So you have SB1, you have the impacts of 267, you have a bonding issue on the 19 ballot, depending on what happens on the 18 ballot. And then you have two opposing groups uh, with the Independence Institute and the statewide uh, coalition led by the Denver Chamber, all trying out, two of them are out trying to gather signatures right now to get stuff on the ballot. So whatever your position is or wherever you stand on these, if we don't get them to the ballot, we don't have anything to work from. If it gets to the ballot, then depending upon where you and your group stand, you get voters to understand the importance of making a decision because it's driving what we get transportation-wise for the future of this state. So we're going to have some issues and we have some work to do. And our local governments, I think most of us are already receiving requests for the different groups to come present to our councils so or where that group's trying to do this or they're trying to do that. So if you have the opportunity to hear them and get their opinions and what they're presenting, please take that opportunity because it may answer some questions for you that you may not have thought about. And there are some very intricate flow charts about what happens if this happens and all the downfall of that that is extremely interesting. I think at least two versions of that are out right now that I've seen, but they're very similar. There's a couple of tweaks on one of them that's a little bit different, but it's not that big. So take the opportunity to think about what we're going to do and what uh, Todd and them are telling you, everything ties back to November. 
And what happens with us? That's all I got. That's all I got. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if we can move on, please, to our committee reports. Uh, I know Ms. Jones is not here. Someone have to back up for the stack. Mr. Partridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, you kind of gave my report by your comments because what could happen in November, but actually the stack we've met a couple times actually since our last meeting. Uh, our meeting last Friday, uh, pretty extensive, and I kind of think to take the motto of what the uh, scouts used to say, be prepared. Anyway, uh, the idea on 267, so if you're not aware, the 267 is being uh, Tabor challenged and that will come up in October. And that's just the COP portion of 267. So with that, CDOT knowing that they have projects already shovel ready basically uh, and the Transportation Commission have taken action to use some of the Senate Bill 1 funds that they received out of the 495 million to go forward and keep these projects on schedule and one probably uh, certainly near and dear to me, but near and dear to uh, our Dr. Cog was the I-25 gap project. And there was quite a discussion on the multimodal projects, but uh, since Dave Kretzinger with CDOT just gave us that report, basically I won't reiterate that, but it was a very lengthy discussion also. And I will say, uh, one of our, our, our director, our main director for, for Dr. Cogalese Jones made the comment certainly that no doubt there's been challenges with CDOT because of the short time frame for a stakeholder to reach out, but it's just reiterated to really make that a great effort and CDOT really took that to heart and knows it's been a challenge. So expect more reach out from CDOT on the multimodal projects. Again, a great discussion on the uh, sales tax initiative. Uh, this one gets a little confusing, but it sounds like there could be possibility of some extra funding that would come out of the uh, sales tax uh, initiative if it would go forward over and above the 6.2 billion project list that has been identified. So CDOT is actually looking at how to split up roughly around 800 million, give an idea. Dr. Cog region is set to get about three to 400 million of that. And statewide planning rules, it was action taken. Dr. Cog staff made great comments. They thought it's been uh, thoroughly reviewed by CDOT. So uh, staff did make recommendation to move forward on the statewide planning rules action. That completes the report. Hey, would you like to also do the county commissioners while you're up, Mr. Partridge? Sure. Yes, we uh, had a very good presentation hosted by Jefferson County from the U.S. Census Bureau uh, regarding the upcoming census to really give a lot of comfort to the reasons that they are doing it, the process they're going through. They want to make sure that it's just a true census for the right reasons and really the, the important point of the census is really going to probably be coming to grants and other funding that we all will look for. So the accuracy is very important but they went through very detailed and how complicated of a process it is but really what was impressive is how dedicated those individuals are from the U.S. Census Service. Ms. Warren would you like to do the area agency on aging for us? Yeah, we Moving meeting. Okay. Mr. Rex, Rack, please. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, so we had a, you know, they're, uh, they're actively recruiting a, a new executive director. I think I mentioned several times now that um, that um, it's been four times. <laughs> oh, we're down to four. Uh, Ken Lloyd, the long. Long, uh, long time uh, executive director of RAC is uh, is retiring. His last, what? The, oh, well, yeah, he's the only executive director that RAC's ever had. He's uh, he's retiring uh, uh, actually July 28th, I believe. So, um, so they're actively rec recruiting. They're planning on having a meeting in which um, the uh, the members of the council have an opportunity to uh, to meet the four candidates and then make a decision shortly after that. The meeting is on June, July 27th. Actually, in this room. Hopefully, the lights and mics work and all that kind of stuff. It's on the punch list. Don't worry. So, uh, so we had that, and we had a discussion about uh, local local agency air quality projects. There was uh, several projects. There was 
four in Boulder that were funded, as well as there's one contingent in uh, Lone Tree. It's a um, uh, is an extension of uh, service in, in uh, for the Lone Tree Link, so we're working on that as well. Uh, we also had a discussion regarding EPA's reconsideration of the light duty vehicle uh, GHG standards or greenhouse gas emission standards and the California Advanced Car Standards associated with that and uh, discussion about the rulemaking that's, uh, that's pending on that. Uh, discussion about the VW uh, uh, mitigation plan and, and uh, how, that's, how that's progressing on the implementation side and some um, uh, a discussion about the voluntary ozone reduction program that uh, CDPHE and the work they're doing with, uh, with some corporate partners on that. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Is anyone here from E470? Or I know Mr. Rakowski's not here tonight. But Mr. Parcher, do you not do all of these? <laughs> as long as you don't turn the lights out on me again. All right. <laughs> I was ready to get off stage. Uh, E-470, uh, probably the most important thing, uh, gave an approval for extension of a three-year contract to do the tolling services to uh, all the, well, the CDOT and the other uh, private entities or public-private entities. And also just to note, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, and actually meeting at the uh, C E-470 headquarters will be the presentation, I believe, from Aurora for the dedication, the groundbreaking and a dedication to the late Mayor Steve Hogan. Thanks, Roger. Mr. Van Meter, I'm going to go to you, then I'll come back to Metro Mayors. Thank you, Chair. Um, RTD held their Fast Tracks Planning and Capital Programs Committee meeting earlier this month. The only item at that meeting regarding fast tracks was a review of the executive summary of the report on fast tracks that staff has repair, prepared, not repaired. <laughs> working on repairing the fast tracks plan, and we've prepared this document that documents all of that. Um, so there's an executive summary that was presented to the board of directors on the history and status of fast tracks. Additionally, I would note the press has been very much on top of that, and I'm sure most folks around the table are aware, but we have both Federal Railroad Administration and Colorado Public Utilities Commission approvals to start removing the flaggers from the University of Colorado A-Line, and six crossings have been removed, and the, the remaining five are in process, which is a good sign, I would add, for um, prognosis or prognostications as to when the G line will open, which I do not have any firm information on, but it is good progress having those approvals for the University of Colorado A line. That concludes my report. Mr. Van Meter, I know that as you remove the flaggers, uh, is there any indication how soon you'll be able to go into the quiet zone on those? That's in process. Um, and we're working with the city and county of Denver and with Aurora on that process. So I can't give you a good firm answer. Looking at Mr. or Director Graves, and I don't know that you would have any better information. No, we don't have any new information at the moment. Uh, the mayor and I recently met with Dave Genova to chat a little bit about it, and I know we're looking at the uh, the details, but we're all very interested in making it happen sooner rather than later. Beep beep. And Indeed, as of course RTD is as well, and that is a joint process where the city is actually responsible for applying for and getting those approval with our approvals with RTD support. Hopefully, you guys will find a way to work as a team to get those horns turned off, because I'm sure that Anthony quit like to quit getting those emails about what are you going to do about my noise complaint. I have another question on the G line now. Um, so, you know, it's been a, a very long process, and I think we've gotten really good with the bureaucracy associated to it, but do you have any idea when you can run more than one test train? Do not have an idea on that. We get one, what, a day? Yeah, we're allowed to have um, one train out for testing. Um, we have requested and are awaiting for permission from the Federal Railroad Administration for multiple trains at a time. 
which then allows us to go into system demonstration performance and prove to the FRA and PUC that our grade crossings are working as intended and safely, which then leads us to the capacity to open that line. Um, so the request is in, it's been in for a while, and we've, um, Dave Genova had a chance early last week, I believe was the timing, maybe it was two weeks ago now, to meet with the Federal Railroad Administration <laughs> Administrator, and my voice causes the screen to go up. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. I'm not going to talk about the bugs that are in this place right now. Yeah, I, maybe that's the signal to cut cut off the bureau, cut off the bureaucrat. Is that that's the signal? Well, I'm just going to say that our flaggers' uh, huts are now become permanent residents of our community because those flagger huts have been growing. They're yeah. breaking them now. Indeed. So, Dave um, Dave Genova met with the Federal Railroad Administration's administrator when um, he was in town for the rail conference that was here a week or two ago and impressed upon the head of the Federal Railroad Administration our interests and the timeline and the key priorities for getting the G-Line open. So he indicated to our board and staff that he had a good meeting. So hopefully that's a positive signal, but I can't give you anything firm. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Could you repeat all that? <laughs> I said, make the screen come back down. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Vim here. Going back to Metro Mayors, uh, the last couple of meetings that we've had have, have all been dealing around the upcoming election issues. Uh, we did have a presentation from the group that is supporting the .62 uh, ballot initiative. Uh, again, that's one of the groups that's going around. What I will tell you that there are a number of mayors, some in the room, that are carrying those uh, signature packets around. They sort of look like this one, so that if you're in the area and you have the desire to get on the person's list of those who would like to sign to get this on the ballot, please see those signature carriers. They cannot sign their own, but they're signing the others. So if you can, uh, take a look at those. But first and foremost, uh, we still need to continue to work on our TIP policy process. Make sure your uh, regional meetings, your sub-regional meetings are happening. If you've got issues, make sure to talk to Dr. Cog, CDOT, and RTD. And for the new members, welcome tonight. And if there is no other business before the group, we are adjourned. Mr. Brockett. Request for outlets at the desks, power outlets, please, for future on the, meetings. It's on the list. Thank you. Oh, Deb got one. Deborah, go ahead. I just wanted to let you know that if you wanted to contact Jeff Sanders, I have some business cards here for him if you want to contact him about the CDOT um, transit development program. Deborah. Director Pfeiffer is going to be on No Copay Radio tomorrow, so tune in and listen to what the city of Arvada is doing for their senior population. It won't take long. <laughs> what station is that? 1430 a.m. 1430 a.m. <laughs> Don't forget, if you need parking stubs, please see Connie. <laughs>